kids speech database. We don't have a lot of kids speech databases, but we do for adults. So if you want to do child speech recognition, how do you do it if you don't have enough? Or let's say accents, you don't have enough of, I don't know, Indian spoken with an English accent. What do you do? So we deal with more as a, what's called a small data problem, difficult situations. And, um, and we compare it with human performance. So humans are still much better than machines at recognizing speech with different accents, ages, noise. So we, we run experiments both on humans and machines and compare them and see, can we learn anything from a human to feed into our machine learning data? So it's a lot of fun, but it's all involves speech processing, whether recognizing speech or uh, detecting a speaker or synthesizing speech. Rob, you, you're okay. a turn. Cool. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, so if I'm on more on the physics side of things, so we do small scale, from nanometers up to a few centimeters, uh, technologies, devices, a lot of sensors. So, if, you know, a couple examples. One is we're, we're building flexible MRI coils right now that you should shove up people's nose to get really accurate images of the pituitary gland right, right in the middle of your skull. Um, that's one example. Um, we're looking at small scale, kind of controlling magnetism at very small scales to make new types of antennas and new ways to capture cells for cancer therapies. And then we also have another miniature magnetics project where we're trying to take these large national labs like Slack up in Northern California that's three kilometers long. These large kind of, you know, you see things store, uh, particle storage rings, CERN and these particle accelerators. So taking these linear ones and trying to take them from three kilometers and really miniaturize them so they would fit basically in a, a 20 meter room. Um, so anything kind of small scale sensing, actuating and, and physics uh, is kind of where we play. Um, I also see another question, how likely is it to be able to join a research lab as a freshman? Um, uh, you know, it, it's definitely possible and it really depends on different faculty have different needs. And so what you do is you, you show up and, you know, I always tell people settle in your first quarter, get good grades, adjust to life. Um, and then maybe beginning of your winter quarter, email faculty and say, I'm interested in your research lab. And a lot of it will have to do with the faculty if they have openings or some faculty need upper division courses to get involved. Mine, actually, I often take freshmen. Um, you know, if you if someone's motivated and clever, we find projects that fit kind of based on your, your knowledge of physics and mathematics. Um, and so what you have to do is just email different faculty and, and see who happens to have an opening and happens to have something that fits with, you know, your skill set at the time. Yeah, there's a question about, uh, is Puneet on the room? He's on here. I don't know if he's hopped in yet, but... Uh, Oh, okay. uh, I see him. I see him. There oh, Puneet is. is here. Puneet is here. Yeah, yeah. Puneet, yes. we were going around talking about our research. If you want to talk about your research, um, sure. So uh, my research is strictly in what would traditionally be called the computer engineering. So uh, I essentially do two kinds of work. One is what's called as computer architecture, uh, where uh, my group looks a lot into uh, what processors and memory systems would look like in future. Uh, and especially as they interact with the emerging uh, hardware technology, where there's new kind of memory devices, new kind of logic devices, new kind of packaging technologies and things like that. That's one aspect of my research. And the second aspect of research, my research is around uh, design automation, which is uh, how building algorithms uh, to aid in design of uh, large digital systems. So those are kind of two parts of my uh, research and uh, uh, I mean, luckily, uh, we do get a lot of undergraduate students working in my lab. At, at least, even at, at this moment, there are probably there are five undergrads working in my lab. Uh, unfortunately, all remotely, but still, they are all working in my lab. So, uh, students contact and they do a good job. Many of them graduate uh, with, the uh, with work done in the, in the group. Right. So any me, questions yeah. I can answer about, of course, my own work, but uh, computer engineering in general, I'll be happy to take. And talking about undergrad research in the lab, we just found out this is recent good news that they're allowing undergrads to start coming back in the lab, which is, I didn't think it would be this fast. So it gives me hope for fall, we're gonna be closer to normal. Um, 
There's also a question about, can you talk a little bit about research in the healthcare related fields, particularly biomedical imaging that Prof and UCE do? I, I, I can talk about that for a second if, uh, if that's all right. Um, so, uh, so let's see, so a few examples. So, uh, you know, we do the, our work in the flexible MRI coils. Um, Professor ya or, uh, Yahya Ramat Sami is an expert in electromagnetics. He, they also do some custom coil design for MRI imaging. Um, uh, Idwin Özcan, he's uh, a, a professor here that does a lot with um, imaging for life sciences. So they do like holographic imaging with cell phone cameras. It's really cool stuff. It's, it's all over the news. So you'll find them if you Google OZCAN. So they do a lot of work in kind of imaging for cell analysis and things like that. Um, also one of our collaborators, he's he and I co-advise students. He's an EE e e by training, but he's over in the the medical imaging department in the med school. Um, and he's, um, he does, uh, Kyung Sung, he does a lot with just different types of algorithms for medical imaging. You know, I'll say one thing that was a, a really pleasant surprise for me coming to UCLA is how close the medical school is, how physically close it is. It's a five minute walk. And so we have a lot of interactions with them. You'd think that if someone's just a 15 minute drive, um, it's, it's the same as a five minute walk, but I have colleagues at other schools where they're, they're separated and it turns out to be kind of a, you know, kind of a challenge for them to get back and forth where we can just hop, hop over in, in a few minutes. And that, that's been really fun for me. Um, oh, uh, I see. So how experienced do you have to be for, to be involved in research? I, I think that really varies on the fact that if you come in, you're motivated and you're bright, there, there are certainly a lot of projects you can get involved with. Uh, the next one, Puneet, this one might be for you. What's the difference between computer engineering and majoring in electrical engineering and doing a tech breadth in CS? Puneet, if you're on, do you mind unmuting and taking that yeah, one? So or, or maybe a beer can. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, I'm saying uh, you have E on one end and CS on the other end. And essentially there is a continuum. You go from E to what you're saying as taking a few CS classes and calling it as a tech bread. That's another, then you go to computer engineering and then you go to pure computer science. That's basically the continuum. It depends on how much emphasis on uh, CS aspects do you need. Uh, and the required core set of courses are also somewhat different between EE and computer engineering. Uh, so if you want to get a lot of exposure to, uh, for example, uh, electromagnetics, for example, uh, but definitely major in EE and then do a tech breadth in CS. Uh, but if uh, that's not where your interests lie, then just switch over to computer engineering. So that's just an example. Uh, uh, even the beginning circuits classes are required classes are different between EE and CE, uh, just because of amount of emphasis needed. So it, it's so that's the kind of the short answer to it. If there is more. Uh, take them. Oh, Abhi, do you want to add something? So computer engineering versus uh, computer science? Uh, is that? E versus CE. Oh, E versus CE. Yeah, I mean, I think the similarities are quite large, actually, but uh, there's a bit more focus on the uh, hardware side, I would say, of computer engineering. And so it's really a bridge between EE and CS, but it's they're all quite similar and they share many, many uh, similarities in my view, at least. Uh, there's a now, question, sorry. Yeah, I can take the next question if you want, uh, the, the, what a new person is gonna do. Yes. Uh, so I actually have a freshman in my lab working right now and uh, she is doing a stellar job and at the rate that she is doing the work, uh, she will more than likely have a publication before she enters her second year. Uh, and uh, I mean, she's really, really smart and doing a really good job. So, so absolutely, she did not have that much of a background. So it took her maybe half a quarter uh, reading up, developing background on the precise project that uh, she was engaged in. Uh, but after that, for the last quarter and a half, I mean, she's been there in my group for like, almost now two quarters. Uh, she's, I mean, literally uh, interacting with PhD students on herself. I sync up with them for like 15 minutes a week. And uh, every week there's substantial progress. And at this point, we are at the point where uh, she's starting to write 
uh, a draft of a, what would be submitted as a paper eventually. Uh, in terms of exact work she did, uh, there is, uh, uh, I mean, this project was surrounding uh, sort of packaging of chips uh, and some algorithms for doing that. So she thought of a method, implemented it, and now she's taking a look at uh, actual uh, commercial package chips and see how that would work under her algorithm. So it, it absolutely, uh, freshmen can contribute and often do. Uh, of course, the commitment required uh, for a first year student would be a little bit higher because they will have to uh, learn something on their themselves. While if you're joining in a, as a, let's say a junior, you have a lot of the requisite background. I have a question about the difference between CS and CE in terms of courses and curricula. I don't know if, if you touched oh. upon that already, Bonita. That one also says so, CS and E. Do you see that one? Yeah, so CSE and uh, uh, CE, the differences are very small. Um, there are two differences that at least I would like to highlight that CE students do a two quarter capstone. Uh, in their final year, while CSC students do a one quarter capstone. And uh, the two quarter capstone in CE, the thought process was that if you're building a hardware software system, you just need more time. Uh, so pulling it off in one quarter is very, very difficult. So CSC capstones are two quarter, CE capstones are one quarter, that's one difference. The second difference is as a computer engineering major, uh, you get uh, far more elective choices. Uh, you can take, uh, bunch of EE electives, you can take a bunch of CS electives, uh, you can even have a tech breadth in CS or have a tech breadth in EE, uh, even that is okay. So you get far more choices. And the yet last uh, thing is that, uh, as I mentioned during my uh, kind of brief spiel in the morning, that uh, CE curriculum is evolving very rapidly. By the time uh, most of you enter uh, UCLA or take your first class, there will be at least three to four new computer engineering classes on offer. Um, so, uh, so that's another uh, uh, somewhat of a difference between CSC and CE. Ah, one more. So, how does research in computer engineering intersect with thematic areas such as healthcare, privacy, and security? It absolutely does. Uh, so as I was pointing out on new courses, there is going to be a new privacy security oriented computer engineering course for undergraduates, uh, which hopefully would be offered for the first time next year. Uh, there's another one on uh, human computer interaction uh, and plenty of times the application use case is actually healthcare and medicine. Uh, that's going to be on the offer. There's another one on uh, which is being planned for uh, uh, AI and machine learning. Uh, and again, there also plenty of times the use case of the project would surround the uh, quote unquote healthcare or medicine. I don't know uh, if there's uh, anything else. Uh, I don't know, Abir or Rob, you want to add on to that? In terms of the CSE? I think you covered it pretty well. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think many of you are asking about possibility of joining at the earlier stage, um, you know, freshman or sophomore. I think it's possible, but I think the majority of students tend to uh, do research a little bit later, just after they have a good grasp of what their interests are and they have some skills. But absolutely, we've had exceptional students at the freshman, sophomore, do, do incredible research and even publish. So, um, so it is possible. But also you shouldn't feel bad if you don't get the possibility the first year because it's a very small percentage actually of students can, can uh, do such research. Sometimes the research is uh, maybe doing, if it's a level of you know, collecting articles or doing something like that, I mean, certainly can start earlier, but if it's contributing to bigger ideas, um, it might help to take a few engineering classes first to just have the skills necessary, unless you come in already being exposed to to uh, many uh, uh, you know many skills already.
And, and maybe one other point to add there, Abir, is that the freshman year, there, there's a lot of things to take on. So one is adjusting to living away from home the first quarter, yeah. you know, yeah. developing kind of study habits for the courses. And something, if you were watching earlier with the student presentations, we have a lot of fantastic clubs. So a lot of uh, first year students like to really dive into, for example, IEEE has their ops program where let's say you don't have a lot of background in some of these engineering topics. You know, I'd never done robotics in high school. They have a lot of cool projects that you can, you can check out and do and kind of build up your skills and then you can dive into the, the clubs at the next level. So not just, you know, there's IEEE, Watt, uh, NSBE, there's also, they have Bruin Racing, they have the Rocket Team. So they're just a, a really large number of different clubs. And so that might be something to consider, you know, if, if you're not doing research right at the beginning, because there's, you know, there's also plenty of time to do it your junior and senior year, is have a look at, at the, all these clubs and they are, you know, there are first that you can always say that with any of these clubs, you you take and then you give back. So first you take and you you learn all these great things from IEEE and then you give back. I mean, you get a leadership position, which you know you give back some of your time. And of course, having a leader, leadership position always often really gives back to you in the end as well. So um, I, I, I definitely want to kind of reinforce all these great clubs. Of course, uh, HKN and all these other ones that, that you heard from, they're, they're really great. And you find which ones that you're passionate about and really, you know, get invested in them. That would be one recommendation. All right. Yes, let's see. My son's a plant transfer in community college. Okay, oh, yeah. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> So feel free if you want to pop more questions in the chat, or you can use the raise hand function if you want to actually have a little back and forth. Either one is you're welcome to do. Maybe we'll give it another couple of minutes if there's no questions. I think we'll call it. Oh, there is one question. How is it to switch majors? I think we addressed this already in the uh, in the major uh, discussion. Um, it's fairly easy. Apunit could probably comment more on the switch between regular EE and CE um, if there are specific requirements. There are specific requirements. I can talk about that. Um, mm -hmm. There's, uh, I and I linked our change of major website uh, in the last presentation, but I can link it again. Um, but to switch between, to switch to any of the computer majors, um, whether it be computer science, CSE or CE, um, you do have to take certain classes first and receive uh, specific grades in order to be eligible to switch because um, those majors are, are very impacted, especially CS and CSC are quite impacted. So there are, if you go to that link that I just put in the chat, it explains pretty, um, uh, uh, it, it explains what the requirements are and what you need to do in order to do that. And we do offer change of major workshops as well um, during the quarter. So when you come on campus or when you start fall quarter, uh, we do offer workshops as well to kind of over do an overview of what you need to do to change your major. And um, there was a sorry. No, I was just saying there was a question about fast track, and uh, Professor okay. Candler is uh, is uh, very, the the head of the program now, so he could probably address that question. Sure, I, I'll, I'll get that. And hopping up one question about uh, faculty. Uh, that work on robotics. So Ankara Mehta, Veronica Santos, Dennis Hong, mm -hmm. there are several others that are escaping my mind at the moment. What, one fun part about the robotics is they're actually working together to put a large open lab space for the robotics faculty. I think it's, it's, it's many thousands of square feet that's gonna be a shared robotics lab between them. Um, and so there's a, yeah, th there's a kind of a large effort already and then they're coalescing that. Um, so fast track program, so, um, how you so with the, it works in two ways to, to get involved. 
And one is just from the applicant pool, we select people that we think will, will, will be a good fit for the program. And so that's kind of a by an invitation only thing. And then for existing students, the process is after your first year. So get in, have a great first year, get great grades, stay involved. And then you can apply um, after your spring quarter grades are in, you can email me. And then what I'll do is I'll collect all the applications and then we'll meet with the fast track committee and then let people know uh, kind of end of summer after your first year on uh, on kind of people that will will admit to that on ramp program. So that that's how that works for fast track. Um, and, then, and then the research question, yeah, I think that's just it's very that you know several of us here have people uh, take fresh sometimes freshman students. Uh, you know, some faculty just by the nature of their work would need someone who's taken some more specific courses, perhaps junior year, and so that's uh, that that that's really all over the map. I would say typical. Um, typical, the median is probably more like a junior. I mean, I think Professor Alwan mentioned that a little bit that, um, um, you know, there are some opportunities for younger, but, you know, it's more often a, a little later after you had some more classes. And, and again, I don't want to, I want to highlight all these clubs and there are plenty of things to really dive into if, if you don't happen to get involved with research right at the beginning. Yeah, I totally agree with what Professor Campbell said. You, you really need the first year to adjust from not only being away from home, but adjusting also to the quarter system because most of you have semesters, right? And the quarter system is 10 weeks and it goes by really fast. And the first quarter, especially, it's a, a, an adjustment time. So give yourself time to adjust, to do well in your classes, to be comfortable, make friends, join clubs. And then as you take more classes and you know what interests you, you can uh, get involved with research. But I really would I totally agree with Professor Campbell. The first year is really more about uh, trying to fit in and adjust in, uh, uh, to the environment. And I would say you, the clubs could be a really good way also of discovering your research passion because they have software, hardware projects. And so if you get involved with IEEE and you do there, it really opens your eyes. And that one is open to freshmen. And actually the biggest audience is for freshmen for IEEE projects. And their projects are really, really good. And so they, uh, so through that, you can even discover, you know, what you really interested in more. Uh, let's see, we did you talk about the fast track program? Sorry, I- it's Yeah, I did, yeah. I did. Okay. I think we're at um, Charles's question. I, I, do students working in Eraser have lab? Are there, did you mean research labs? Um, get classes selection priorities for related classes. You might have, instead of in a race, you might have meant research lab. So I'll just I'll guess that's what it was. Um, no, there, for for classes, um, there's not particular priority if you're working in a, in a in a specific research lab. But I will say, if it's kind of related to the research lab, it's probably going to be more of an upper upper div course, and those those are much less likely to be full or crowded because you know, once you get to the upper division that I think I mentioned it briefly in my presentation that the class size is kind of trimmed down quite a bit uh, for the, these upper div ECE courses. Um, traits for uh, traits most important to join the research group. Yeah, that really depends on the faculty. It could be some, some faculty says, well, if you're a wizard at Python, um, that, that'll, that'll help get you started. For me personally, it's uh, someone who's just really enthusiastic about diving into a new area. Professor Gupta mentioned, you know, it takes a half a quarter at least to kind of bring yourself up to speed. So this willingness to kind of independently study an area and, and kind of get yourself up to speed about areas, it's something you didn't know about at all. I think that that kind of spirit and motivation is actually a key thing for me. I don't know if Abir Puneet, if either of you have something with it, you think for, you look traits for your, your student researchers. How I select students for research? Yeah, are there particular yeah. things you look so for? I, yeah, I mean, obviously, for me, um, uh, you know, obviously commitment and work ethics, but also some some of the projects we have require some specific skills, and so I look at you know classes they've taken and and if that uh, prepares them for the research uh, for this person. But over the years I've had many, but most of them joined me sophomore or junior. And actually I've had several who stayed with me for PhD students. So um, I've had one, two, yeah, three students who joined me as undergrads and then stayed on as did the master's and PhD with me. So that was wonderful. Um, the other thing we do allow students to take graduate classes um, and, you know, to substitute appeal to take a graduate class in lieu of an undergraduate class. 
especially if they're doing well, and that usually happens around senior year. And actually that's a great opportunity for students to explore topics in more depth. Um, so again, the, the undergrads who joined me actually did take graduate classes and we took my graduate class, we really liked it, wanted to do research, but the other professors as well. So, so that's another thing is take graduate classes when you, you know, but that's later on, junior or senior year and see if you like it. But, um, so it varies, it varies a lot. I know some, Professor I for example, has a large number of undergrads and he takes students, even at freshman, they do medical type research and some doesn't involve uh, you know, some of them could be method data processing or entry. So, you know, it doesn't require very advanced engineering classes. So it depends on what the, what the research project is and, and the requirement. But certainly they look at GPA, they look at the type of classes you're taking, a little bit of your dedication, your interest, uh, any experiences you've had. Um, willing that, yeah, somebody's a willingness to think independently. Very good, yeah. Let's see. So, are there any other questions? Sorry, I missed. What was the eraser me meant to be? The eraser lab. I, I thought it meant in research labs. I'm, I'm just guessing that oh, it was okay. an autocorrect or something. Yeah. Okay. I think we have covered most of them. So, feel yeah. free to pop in other questions, anyone. Yeah, or if you're interested in another breakout session, you feel also you should feel free to to join if you have questions for students or alum. So I think we'll hang out a few, few more minutes. Those of you, if you have questions, feel free to pop them in. Um, if you wanna catch, as Professor Alwan mentioned, if you wanna catch the last few minutes of either the alumni or the student panels, you are welcome to do that. But uh, we'll be around here if there are any final questions you have. <laughs> 